There are a lot of meditation apps out there. Well, here's a different type of mindfulness. It's called Ecosoma. We'll be led through a quick session of this on Traverse Talks, and I promise you'll become more aware of the connections of random things all the way to the earth and through yourself. Our guest is Petra Cuppers, a disability culture activist, author, artist, and professor of English. She wrote Ecosoma, Pain and Joy in Speculative Performance Encounters. She'll also talk about dealing with chronic pain. Petra Cuppers, you say that people can say your name or pronounce it how they want. I find that very interesting because most people who are activists will be be very uh, firm about making sure their names are pronounced correctly. Tell me why you're okay with it not being the way you want it to be said. Yes, so my name can be used in multiple different ways because I don't come from an English-speaking country. So very few people who can speak English can pronounce my name the way that it was pronounced in Germany, right? So it's not, I mean, I can't really fault people for not being able to pronounce my name properly because it's a different language, right? So you can't easily get into that language. Also, I come from a generation of people where it was important to many feminists to reclaim their names, you know, reclaim their names from the father's lineage. So many of us carry the names of our fathers. And while I honor my lineage, while I honor where I come from, I found it important to reclaim my name. So I, I got rid of the umlauts over my name. So initially there was like two little dots over my name. And... Um, and that means that it, there is now no real pronunciation of my name. It doesn't exist as a in any language as a word that you can just easily pronounce. So I find it quite liberating. I'm just allowing you to pronounce it whichever way you like. A Spanish speaker will pronounce it very differently from someone who speaks English, from someone who speaks German, from someone who was born speaking Mandarin. You know, so many different ways of pronouncing names. And I find that quite delicious as an improviser. Oh, I'm, I feel the same way. I've often been called many different names, but I know they're talking to me and I don't take offense to it. But I also haven't, you know, been faced with uh, having my name used against me in disrespectful, racist ways most of the time. I think that's a very important um, angle here that I am also a white woman. Right? Yeah. So while I come from a different country and while as a disabled woman, I experience discrimination, I do not experience that sense of not belonging um, in, a, in a US centric environment. I come from a place where there's many different languages around me. I grew up with German, Dutch, Flemish, you know, like all these different languages were just all around me. So it's a very different kind of language environment from a US one where indeed having white skin provides a very different kind of privilege. Mm. I agree. And you bring up an interesting point, which I'm wondering about in, in American culture, how we would be perhaps more inclusive if we heard more languages surrounding us from an earlier age. I agree. I love being in non-English speaking environments because I find it often very relaxing. You know, it's just very, it's very nice to be in an environment and to just hear the sound of humans speaking without necessarily knowing what they're speaking about. I don't need to know what they're speaking about. I enjoy that conviction reality that being with without having to you know even inadvertently eavesdrop so I do think it's it feels very homey to me to be in a multilingual environment oh I love how beautifully you describe that to being connected with but without understanding the actual words. Oh, lovely. Well, I think that kind of falls into your book, Ecosoma, Pain and Joy in Speculative Performance Encounters. Please describe for our listener what Ecosoma is. Ecosoma is so many things, but one of the core things that I try to capture in Ecosoma is the deliciousness of being involved in the world right? The deliciousness of being with 
the natural world, the more than human world and the human world, the wide diversity of, of the world around us. So in ecosoma, I'm trying to pay attention to the soma. You know, this is a word that many of us don't use on a regular basis. It's a, it's a somatic sensing, a feeling inside ourselves. You know, the way that we are, we are holding ourselves, feeling ourselves, the way that we have sensations that we can't necessarily immediately verbalize, you know, the kind of somatic experience of the world. And then there's the word eco, you know, this environment, the inworldedness, the fact that we're surrounded by world in so many ways. And putting those two together is really exciting to me because there always stays a gap. You know, here's eco and here's soma. I'm not just talking about ecosomatics. I'm not talking about one new word. I'm talking about eco, soma. These two concepts are in play with one another. And I, I'll give you an example, right? So right next to me here is a very comfortable blanket. And it's a, a, a teal colored blanket. It's very soft, the kind of blankets that probably many of us have around our houses. I can lean into this blanket and I can feel it against my skin. I can wrap myself in it. I can feel its warmth and it holds my body and it makes me feel held and cozy. At the same time, also aware that this blanket comes from something that's quite alien to me. The blanket that I'm holding is in the end a plastic blanket, right? These very comfy fleece blankets are plastic. They come from, from material, organic material that's been under deep, deep pressure for so many years, for eons of years, and then got transformed into oil and then got transformed into plastics. You know, all these mechanisms are interesting to think about as I'm experiencing the comfort of the blanket. I'm also thinking about what happens when you wash this blanket. And when you wash that blanket, these little fibers come out of fleece, right? We know that, right? We know that our fleece materials create all these little fibers that we can try to capture as in our washing machines, but they're hard to capture. And they will go down into the waterways and they will um, infest fish and the insides of fish. So as I am holding this blanket, I'm experiencing this comfort, I'm thinking about the fish, I'm thinking about the labor practices that bring this blanket to me, that make these blankets so affordable. I think about the materials where the blanket comes from. All of that together is for me an ecosoma inquiry not to alienate me from the blanket, right? That's, that's not really quite the point, but to be aware of what it means to be comfortable in the world, to be held and warm, and how that connects me as an interdependent creature with so many aspects of the material world. Oh, well, Petra, you're asking us to think very deeply and connectedly. Let's think about it for ourselves. What are you sitting on right now? Listeners, what are you sitting on? Maybe you're sitting in a car right now. Maybe you're sitting at home in a chair. Like what is the material that is holding you right now? What if you just take a minute to become aware of what it is that supports you and where does it come from? Maybe it's leather, maybe it's cotton. What are the sociocultural histories of cotton? What are the sociocultural histories of petrochemicals? What are the sociocultural histories of leather or of wood? What are the costs of cars? We're just becoming aware of that and just sensing into it, feeling it literally hold our sits bones, feel it against our spine. And we're just breathing into that and becoming aware of that network, the interdependent web, the ecosoma web that we are part of and that we influence and give thanks. Yeah. You know, for that moment, in the paying attention, we're also giving thanks. That's also a really important part for me of this, you know, that we, we take the joy, we take the pain, we take the thanks and the grace and the being held in this world. So it, it calls us to actions that might make us have choices that are kind to the world. Uh, and kind to ourselves. But it also means that we're just honoring where we are and what is affordable to us. You know, I, I'm a disabled woman, like many disabled people. Many, many disabled people don't have um, the economic means to, to do exactly as they wish with their consumer choices. So it means also being aware of the costs of living and giving grace, thanks, and joy into that interdependent web. 
Thank you for helping me out with that thought, because in my mind, I was immediately going to guilt, Mm -hmm. feel guilty for having these things and for loving the fuzzy blankets at my home, but feeling guilty for what it is doing. But when I give thanks, I appreciate it more. And I feel as if I would take care of it more. Hmm. Petra, how did Ecosoma come to you? So Ecosoma has been with me for for quite a long time now. But the first inklings that I have of wanting to address the somatic effects of performance happened when I was watching a show in Australia. So I was in Melbourne, Australia, and I was watching a show of uh, people who deemed to have cognitive differences and who were performing on this public plaza in Melbourne. And they were performing a show on large large structures on the on the plaza they were sitting on top of these structures and they had these they were all dressed in white they had white face paint on so they just were very very shrouded and they had cheese wedges on and bishop's mitres and all kinds of very fabulous costumes it was it was pretty amazing and they were just reaching their hands out to the audience. And the audience were just the people who were walking through this plaza. They had eyes painted onto their hands and they were reaching the palms out towards us. And I was watching this show and witnessing it and just enjoying the sunshine above me. Again, the conviviality of people all around me. And I was thinking about the, the politics of this show. So I was able at that time to think about, well, that's kind of a representational critique of the invisibility of disabled people in the world. You know, there's there's all these kinds of politics that I'm very familiar with as someone who works in disability arts. But really what was so exciting to me was just the joy that people took in sitting on these structures and acting with their, with all their hearts and their, their, their eyes on their hands reaching out. There was just such an embodied sensation of presence that I felt I needed a different framework for how to capture that joy. And SOMA was for me that way of capturing the joy and the presence of acting that is not just about political communication, but that is about a visceral embodied communication. News happens fast and often here in the Pacific Northwest. Make sure you never miss a news headline by following NWP Broadcasting on Twitter. Classical music news, more your thing? Then follow NWPB's Classical Twitter account by searching for NWPB Classical. apologize for thinking about fear again, fear and guilt, but I've been raised in a culture where you you don't take up a lot of space and move around. And even if it's a middle school dance party, you stand on the side of the wall. <laughs> and then the freedom you get when you finally are able to let your body go and not care of the perceptions that people are seeing you as and just let your body move the way it wants to and engage with the environment around you. So Petra, as a person who uses a wheelchair, you mentioned in your writings, you know, unstable ground. When you are in the air with the gravity, does fear ever come into you as you're letting your body move? Yes. Fear is there. I think fear is always the other side of performance excitement. (laughs) (laughs) I am an improviser, right? So that's the kind of core forum that I've trained in and that I think many, many disabled people are trained in because we are all moving in a world that is not designed for us. Mm. A world that is normate, that has architectural ideas, that has behavioral ideas that do not fit those of us who have different kinds of body minds. So um, as someone who moves in that world, I often have to improvise. So do many of us. So making that improvisation and the fear of being rejected, Mm. we're automatically not fitting in, but we might also get rejected when we try to fit in. So that fear, that pain and that joy are again something that I think um, one can capture when we think about being free in space and moving with the impetus that comes from inside. That inside impetus is always shaped 
by the culture that we're in, is always shaped by the cultural influences. We started by talking about white privilege, right? It's it's shaped by who's given permission to take space and who has been uh, called life not worth living, mm. who has been racialized into, um, into negative stereotypes, who is not supposed to take up space. So once again, as I'm moving freely, I'm also trying to connect with all these layers of what it means to be an embodied person in space. And I'm trying to be in a responsible and accountable relationship to the momentary freedom that I might be experiencing. And I'm trying to find ways of extending that freedom in collaboration with others. Mm. So that's the heart of so much of this performance work. Mm. And do you feel that you do transcend into those spaces and feelings? Or is it a struggle for you at times? I almost feel like it's a meditation that you're doing. It feels like a meditation. Okay. It feels like a meditation. So I, when I am um, taking a group of people, often a fellow group of disabled uh, artists into, oftentimes we might just be working right outside a car park, right? So <laughs> a lot of us, you know, and I'm talking about the natural spaces, that's right. oftentimes the one step away from the car park because that's that's kind of the natural space of, of many, many disabled people. Oh, Petra, just a moment. You say car park, just so the listener understands. Literally, you get into your car and it's opening your car door in that space right there. It could be that space or it could be the space where we stand up outside of that, get the wheelchair okay. out and maybe put that one foot onto the curb you know, the curb that, that gets us to touch the forest floor that's on the other side of the concrete. Any of these spaces, it's about the small spaces. It could be the space of the car door. It could be the space beyond the curb. Whatever it happens to be, all of these spaces, like meditating on what it means to really feel that little twig beneath your foot, or if you don't feel your foot beneath your hand, or if you don't feel your hand against your chin, against your cheek, those are moments that are really important and powerful to me, like little meditations of what it means to be human, alive, feeling, and embodied in nature. Mm. I got lost in a sense of time there with you. I read while studying you and um, disability activism that time is different for those with disabilities. How does time play out for you? It's a beautiful question. So yeah, one of, one of the chapters in the book that speaks to the concept of crypt time. Crypt time is a concept that I very much bring back to Anna McDonald, who is an Australian activist, whose disability showed it itself in such a way that people didn't think for the longest time that she was communicating. Um, and through her own powers, found a way to communicate like one, one letter at a time through communication devices. She's speaking about crypt time, about this incredibly slow time, that speaking time, the time that you and I are in right now, the speaking time is this super fast time. And her time is extremely slowed down where a word takes forever to come out and no one in the nomad world has patience to be there. But she speaks and writes so beautifully about that the pain of exclusion of living in slow time, of not living in that super fast time of the nomads. I found that her work so, so powerful and so moving because it also speaks so strongly about exclusion. It's a time that is really utterly different from not just from uh, from corporate time, not just from the nine to five time, right? But even just from the ordinary hanging out with one another time that so many of us can still take somewhat for granted. It is such a difference. So um, I'm intrigued by how disabled people can offer temporal and spatial differences to the world, how we can experience things so differently. For myself, well, actually, my wife tends to joke that my crypt time is really fast time because when I'm on my scooter, I move much faster than most bipedals, you know, so I, see. So I don't necessarily call that crypt time because it just seems like that's Petra time. <laughs> I'm just pushing by. <laughs> <laughs> but there certainly is a time difference. I find it very hard to slow down to the to the walking pace of bipedals, right? Because my it's kind of hard with my hand to do the control in such a way that 
that I can creep along as slow as your average bipedal. So I'm instead going whoosh, and then I wait for people. But in myself, when I'm um, when I'm not just whooshing around with my scooter, I have experienced crip time many times when I'm in pain. And that's how many wonderful writers write about crip time. It's in its relationship to pain and the, the temporal distortions that happen when you find yourself floating in pain space. Oh, pain. Petra, you have written about pain in your life. How do you manage pain or accept pain? How do you deal with it? Mm-hmm. Often when, when pain is very intense, I am... Um, I either move very slowly. I write in the book about moving under one of these blankets. I use, use, it's actually exactly the same blanket that I was just touching earlier. Um, I move under this blanket like an amoeba and just let the teeniest, tiniest movements of my fingers influence the shape of the blanket. And so there's a sense of human movement and non-human movement in a really interesting Mm. connection with one another. But the other thing that helps me to engage pain is is writing and it's often poetry writing so i am i'm a poet as well as a as an academic writer and it's often in poetry that i can find the best way to express sensations the multiplicity and the layeredness of sensation that emerges out of pain mm. so that I, I think so much of the the way that that ecosoma that layering of sensation that is described as ecosoma comes for me out of pain when i am really deeply meditating on all the sensations that i have i think like many people who experience chronic pain we know that pain is a complicated thing Pain is not something you can just say, oh, this is pain and this is a 10 or this is an 8 or this is a 4, you know, the way that doctors try to describe pain. Mm -hmm. If you lived with pain for a really long time, it becomes a a very different kind of sensation. I I describe it as an orchid or rose that opens and has layers and and, um, different kinds of textures in it. So if I, for instance, when I'm in pain, if I focus on the sensation of air on my arm, it allows me to find a little bit of space between myself and pain, creates alternative kinds of sensations. So I can use somatic modalities to help me when I'm in pain. I can use my training in a different kind of dream journey practices, embodiment practices to alleviate my pain without always or or in addition to drug regimes. Wow. So to live well with pain, you find those spaces in between and you meditate and think deeply about the layering of those sensations. Mm -hmm. Why not just suppress the pain? Why think so deeply about it? I just don't think it's very possible. And it depends on what kind of pain you have. But when I'm in pain, I cannot suppress it. It's also a part of who I am. It makes me who I am in the world, which is why I think it's so so interesting to write about the sensations of a particular disabled person in the world, that, that the kind of impetus behind ecosoma, you know, writing from a disability culture perspective. It shows what it means to be in the world as someone who often has to pay a, a lot more attention to my embodied being than someone who doesn't experience pain does. Right. So there, there's a request, a requirement to be aware of self and world in a way that, that someone who lives in a pain-free life doesn't have to. While we're on the pain subject, I want to ask about religion specifically Christianity and and the salve of heaven as uh, a way to be free of pain. Um, Because as I've gotten older, I've seen heaven as more of an excuse not to work through problems or to try to, you know, work with your pain. But uh, they always say you can't have heaven on earth, and so why try? But you write um, and point out that pointing to an elsewhere for a reward is a powerful mechanism of control. So when we're being told, ah, yes, you are in pain, you're not fully abled body, but heaven, you'll have a whole body, you won't be in pain, so they're there. Can you explain that more and about the control of that? Right, yeah. Well, if if everybody were to rise up and ask for accommodations in this life, which could just include a ramp or 
working from home when you're told that you have to come in in the middle of a COVID crisis, right? <laughs> so if, if that's all it takes to make you feel, experience some of the joy that we're just talking about, then being asked to wait for earthy, somatic, bodily delights for some kind of afterlife is a form of control. It is trying to create, to keep things the way they are like nine to five workplaces, like places with lots of stairs. I mean, really, there are often solutions. They will not take away all pain. Disability is not something that you can just legislate out of the world with rams and, you know, and, and with, with rules that, that shift things slightly here and there. There will always be pain. But I find it very problematic to point to an afterlife when there's so many ways in which we could be much kinder towards one another. I write in this book not just about disability exclusion, I also write about racism, the histories of colonialism. The, I write a lot about Nazi backgrounds as someone who's German and comes from an environment that is still coming to terms with what it means to be a perpetrator nation. You know, there's so many ways in which we can create a more just, a more socially just world around us. Anything that keeps us away from trying to do this in the here and now feels very wrong, mm -hmm. feels like a very, very wrong move. And alleviating pain, physical pain, psychic pain, the pain of exclusion, the pain of racism, so many different kinds of pain, I think the core principle of so much social justice work. So in this way, I understand my creative labors, and the kind of work that I'm describing in Ecosoma to be social justice labor. What have you learned or discovered while listening to Traverse Talks? Share your thoughts at 100.nwpb.org and it may be used on air to help celebrate NWPB's centennial. That's 100.nwpb.org to record your public broadcasting story. So I'm going to flesh out this question with you because this involves technology and I've heard people being very enthusiastic that this technology is going to enable those who are disabled to participate in our world. But for me, I think it's a virtual world, but your physical being is still here and that world needs work on too. So I'm, it's complicated to me. I'm excited, but also, yeah, but there's more work to be done. Yeah, I, I love how you talk about that. You know, that complexity is something I feel too. So I, in some ways, um, it was very exciting to see the whole world switch into the communication channels that disabled people have been using forever. An activist called Mia Mingus talks about access intimacy. And as someone who uses a scooter, um, I often cannot get into people's private homes because many people have lots of stairs and I can't get in. So in March 2020, I began seeing people's home spaces and it was fabulous. I mean, I've never seen so many private home spaces than I have on Zoom meetings. So it was quite a delight to me. <laughs> and I think to many disabled people who are indeed, I mean, I'm, I'm in no way homebound and many people are, but I'm not. I do. My home is accessible and I, I can drive a car, but I can't get into the private spaces of people who walk stairs. So so that was pretty delicious. But there is this fact that is true that the the Zoom space can be very isolating. And we as performers need to come up with ways of connecting ourselves physically so that we don't just become extensions of screens. Okay, so that seems really important to me. But again, I think many disabled people lead the way in finding ways to think somatically about what it means to be in a screen based culture and how else we can use our imagination as access tools for us to dance together, to move together, to have sensations and joy and delight together. Do you want an example? Yes. <laughs> so since the pandemic started, I've, I've been working with Movement Research, which is a experimental movement um, organization. They run twice a year um, an event called MELT. So for the last three MELT sessions, I've been offering an online somatic form of movement to people. Uh, the last two versions of this were called Starship Somatics. 
And in Starship Somatics, I ran hour long sessions for a whole week. Um, and people came to these from all over the world, you know, like 40, 50 people at a time. Uh, many of them were disabled people. So, and, and some of them spoke about being more or less homebound and not being able to go out at all. And we were able to be with each other in this Zoom space and it was delicious. And what I do with people in these Starship Somatics is we go on dream journeys together where we, we do what we did here in our session. We touch in with the materials of our world. You know, we touch again what we're sitting on, the room that we're in. We feel our ancestral lineages. You know, we might go on a dream journey and meet someone who's, who's been an important part of your journey. And then we, we sail among the stars. You know, we go together out into space. And then we go into breakout rooms once we are in that star space and we, we move with one another. And some of us might just be sitting still and meditating, but the other person is witnessing you doing that and can see your beauty. Some of us are dancing with large gestures through space. You know, some of them have little studios and just dance and move. And again, someone is witnessing them and is getting the, the reverberations of that energy. It kind of fills us. Some of us audio describe what we're seeing. So we're using our imagination tools to do disability culture labor, which is audio describing ourselves. So for instance, I'm audio describing myself now. I am, I am a, a white, cis queer woman and I have very short shorn hair. I look like a silver otter here and I have uh, yellow glasses on and I have a pink lipstick and I have a very fuzzy uh, like a, a frill, a scarf around my neck and I have different layers of gray that covers that cover me and I'm sitting on a red leather sofa against a pink backdrop. So those of us who just heard that have a very different image of me, I imagine, than when I'm just talking. Because we have these ways of filling out our imagination and we get some little hint of what it is that we might be seeing. We can fill and brush and paint a picture for ourselves. That is a wonderful human awareness method. So I'm using that in the Starship Somatics to take us onto alien planets, to dance at alien discos, to dance with one another, to dance inside and outside. And it's a very, very accessible way of being deeply somatically engaged and feeling ourselves and others. And I think it's such a useful way of thinking about grounding ourselves in Zoom times. Oh, I love it. And when you're describing this, all I could think about is the art, the way you described yourself to and the movement and the dancing. I really feel like your work encourages everyone to put more art into their life, not as a hobby. What else can people do, you know, practicing ecosoma and then expressing what they've experienced? What recommendations do you have? Oh, lovely. Well... I mean, just really easy ways to do it and quick ways, take a leaf or take a rock and just really spend some time with it. Take a timer, you know, just put a 10 minute timer on or five minutes if 10 minutes feels too long and you get really awkward and go like, what the heck am I doing? You know, five minutes and just just look, look at this beautiful object that you have and look at the patterns in it and look at the structures in it, look at the, the leaf structures, how the veins run through the leaf. Then after that timer rings, set yourself another timer with half that time because people get really self-conscious if that goes on for too long. So just like <laughs> half whatever time you initially gave yourself and then try to move those patterns into the world. Just let your arms track the veins in the leaf or the veins in the rock and see if maybe your spine can begin to move with that organic or rock-like instruction that you've been given and just move with that very gently it doesn't doesn't take a long time it could just be a, say two minutes and one minute but you're connecting yourself with patterns that are outside the patterns that humans have shaped for themselves right and i think that is such a powerful way of engaging with the world find a little moment in and see that there are other patterns than the ones that humans have shaped for themselves because our culture and our cultures have created very specific ways of being. And it's very liberating to step outside of these particular ways of being just for a minute. 
Oh, Petra, beautiful. Yet again, what do you want able-bodied people to understand? I would love able-bodied people to understand that there is disability culture work out there and that disabled people can create rich and powerful art and culture works and that they can be part of disseminating this kind of work. So I encourage people to find out about disabled artists in their own locality and beyond, to share that with disabled people that they know, because many disabled people are often quite isolated. We don't teach disability culture in schools. It's very hard to connect yourself. Many disabled people speak about a form of coming out when they actually finally meet a group of people who understand disability as a positive thing. It's a bit like queer world, right? We come to queer families, to queer love, the same way that we come to disability culture worlds. We usually come to that later in life. It's not something we were born into. So reach out, help people to connect to disability arts and culture out there. Mm, beautiful. And what would you want people with disabilities to understand? That you're beautiful, that your way of being is rich and gorgeous, that people can learn from you, that people can learn from you different ways of being in this world. And that is an incredibly enriching part of what it means to be human. And that we need these different perspectives of being in the world in order to create a more just culture for all of us. Petra, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much and have a beautiful day. Right now, I'm sitting here with you, and I sense the studio chair. I feel its cushiness that supports me. My fingers feel the hard, cold plastic of this audio board and the lumpy buttons. And I sense your connection. It's good to connect. Our guest was Petra Cuppers. Her book is Ecosoma. And this is Traverse Talks. Thanks for listening. I'm Sue Ann Ramella.